We know how to get people to work together. How do you get robots, drones, autonomous vehicles, and other smart systems to collaborate? Welcome to Tech First with John Kutsir. No jobs are simple. Take ordering a pizza and getting it. You've got to phone somebody or use an app or be online. That order has to go somewhere. Somebody has to take it. Some bread needs to be prepared, some dough, some toppings need to be put on. That gets finished, goes in an oven, goes to a delivery person. He picks it up, she picks it up, drives it to your home. All that is coordinated. But everything takes steps and processes. If we're going to get to an automated world, an autonomous life, if you want to say it that way, how do you get smart machines in the kitchen, in delivery, in production, all those things working together? How do you enable that? To chat about this, we are going to bring in our guest who is Kumar Dev Chatterjee. He's the founder and CEO of Unmanned Life. Welcome, Kumar Dev. Uh, thank you, John. Welcome, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here and uh, speak about these topics, which are very close to my heart. Wonderful. Um, talk to me uh, as a bit of an intro a little bit. How you see the future of machines working together? Yeah, so um, my view on this, uh, John, and you know, we we discussed this a few times, and of course, we've exchanged on Facebook and other on other platforms. Is that I believe we are entering what I call an era of autonomy or an era of, of the autonomous economy, and what that effectively means is that today we have uh, humans first in most jobs and most. Uh, sort of uh, processes, whether that's industrial or retail or even food delivery, you just mentioned that, medical delivery. And um, and we are going to move, my vision is that we're going to move to a world where be machines first. So the first thing you'll think about when you're thinking about delivery of food would be not who's going to come and knock on your door, but which drone is it going to be today, right? Uh, and, and the first thing you'll think about when you're like, oh, I've got to go to a hospital or I've got to get a checkup done is basically which machine room with which machines are going to be looking at you. And today, this might sound a bit overtly futuristic, perhaps, like, you know, uh, uh, back to the future type of futuristic. But uh, the reality is that this is happening, as you know, and as I know, across the world at, at an increasing pace. And why is that? It's because machines are not only the future in terms of productivity and efficiency, but today we need them. Look at the COVID world, and it's obvious that we need to have less and less human interaction for things where humans don't need to be put at risk. And that's where machines are perfectly suited for that. And we have huge challenges with that, right? Because you see a lot of machines being created. You see a lot of robots being made, delivery robots. You see automated machinery being put into factories, other places like that. But often we're thinking of a very discrete job or a very specific task for the machine and not completing an entire task. So we, we have something that might help us uh, plant a seed, but maybe not also harvest or might help us, you know, drive a nail, but not build the whole house, correct? Absolutely, John, spot on. Uh, and let's ask ourselves a question from a very standard standpoint. Why is that? Because if you go to a greenhouse, you'll see that the, one, the person who's pulling the seed out of a plant it's not the same person who's watering the plant, and it's not the same person who's actually is you know sort of working on that seed and turning that into something else. It's a team of different human beings performing different tasks. Uh, they might be skilled at different tasks, but in a particular process, they do one particular task in general. Now, in in our world, we all do multiple tasks sometimes at the same time. But for most industrial or retail or normal processes, one person does one particular job. And if you were to replace that with machines, exactly, it's not enough to have one machine or a couple of machines that do different things. You need to have a team of machines, robots, drones, whatever you call them, working together, just like a human team would do. And so you've got to get over that to be able to enable the scenario where an entire process run by human beings can be now run by robots and perhaps some human beings. And, and to do that, uh, we don't just need the hardware. We need some communication protocols. We need some interoperabil interoperability protocols, correct? Uh, yeah, music to my ears, right. So uh, <laughs> so the history of this goes back quite a while. A lot of people have tried to build the everything machine, right? And you know, you know that as, as a tech journalist or somebody in, in the field. Um, and they have failed. And for, for good reasons is that hardware 
is not really hard to do. Hardware is fundamentally, from the physics standpoint, built to do certain things. And when you think about a team of hardware, a team of robots working together, number one is that point you mentioned, communication. How do you communicate? I mean, just take a rugby team or what you guys call a football, right? It's rugby in the rest of the world. Uh, so take a rugby team or a football team and you're like, let's communicate and let's figure out how to do a scrum. But to communicate, you, somebody has to take leadership. And sometimes the leadership, the baton has to be passed on. These are quite simple things for human beings to perhaps do, but very hard for machines to do, particularly just hardware. So you need some sort of a brain that's not hardware, that's software, that is able to manage those communications and bring it together. A very simple question I'd ask everybody, if there's five people in a room and you didn't know each other and you didn't speak each other's language at all, and but everybody I mean, you were told at the same time, in your language, get out of the door at full speed, one at a time. What are the chances, what are the chances you're going to do that without colliding? Zero, yeah. right? And so that's exactly what happens if you have a hardware-based, uh, if you try to have a hardware solution. You need to have a supervisory brain, a software that's able to actually talk to every each of those robots and these machines. We don't understand each other and don't have a share, don't share a common language. But not only they need to be directed in a way by someone or something that is able to see what needs to be done and what each one is individually doing. And this needs to be done at very fast, very fast and adaptively. So if, if something starts off and then the positions of different robots change, someone needs to understand that and readapt what the next step will be. That can only be done by software mathematically from a computer science perspective. And you know, we can be a scientist, we know that, that can be done only through software. And so that's the missing bit, John, which is why a lot of these let's do everything machines haven't gone anywhere. I mean, I know that you are a great Tesla fan um, and, and Tesla undoubtedly is at the edge of the uh, of the automotive world when it comes to EVs and autonomous driving. And if you look at under the hood of a Tesla, of course it's impressive hardware, but there's super impressive software, right? Yeah. They're ahead of the game on all the software issues, right? And that is the key. You can only have fantastic hardware performance if and only if your software is ahead of the curve and is able to make the hardware think. That's a really, really great insight. And and it's funny because when I when when you start talking about Tesla, where I thought you were going for a second was Tesla was going to build the machine that was going to make the machine, right? They were going to build the totally automated factory. They pulled back from that because they, they lacked the ability to actually do that. It, it is something that I assume will happen in the mid to near term future, but they couldn't do that. But you're absolutely right. Great hardware is hobbled with poor software. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to offend a bunch of people here, but I, I, I'd call out Samsung <laughs> as, as one of the, the people, one of the companies in the world that need to learn that and probably have learned that. Yeah, but there are many yeah, others as yeah. well. No, uh, and, and, and absolutely. Great I think insight. The other thing that, I wanted to, the thing that I wanted to ask you though is, um, oh, I haven't lost you, have I? Where? Oh, your video is good. back. Okay, good. Hello. What I wanted to ask you is you've actually, so you're not just building something um, and, and in, in, in th out of thin air here, you're actually implementing things. Talk about what you've built yeah. so far and what you've implemented so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me start off by, can you hear me now? Am I back? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Perfect. So, um, so my company that I'm the co-founder of is uh, Unmanned Life, and Unmanned Life is the world's first autonomy as a service company. So we are the pioneers in creating exactly the thing that I talked about, this thinking brain, the software brain that can make different types of robots work together as an autonomous team, as an autonomous workforce. And the idea is very simple, is that if you were owning an industry or you had a or, or a city, or you had to run things in the city, or you had to get something done, and you wanted to A, supplement your human workers uh, with robots, or you wanted to get change a, a process and have only robots do a particular thing, what would you do? Would you go and buy a robot? A very low chance of you going to go and, go and buy a robot. You're gonna to turn to somebody and say, how do I do this, right? And if you think about it from a design perspective, you see the first thing you need is that software brain that talks to you like software does to a new user interface where you can figure what the robots need to do and that's it. And you sit back and then the robots go out there and do that process the way it should be done with a degree of reliability, safety, and that's exactly what Unmanned Life does. So we are an autonomous sure. platform and cool. what we deploy is autonomous workforces that 
enable uh, Industry 4.0 and smart city use cases. Can you give us some examples of uh, installations you've done, some some uh, companies or, or organizations that you've worked with? Absolutely. Um, so we started off by doing uh, Industry 4.0, which is effectively, in a, in a nutshell, is uh, automating and digitizing industry. So we went into uh, Swiss Post, and we worked with Swiss Post and a couple of other large uh, American companies that we're working with today. Um, we are a part of the Walmart Coha, uh, Accelerator. Uh, you know, we've done some work with some other ones. Uh, and effectively what we do there is you've got robots working together in a team in a warehouse and moving parcels at full speed. So I could show you a video, but I think it might not fit in the format of the, of the live interview. I'll send that to you later on. Uh, and you'll see these robots, just like human beings, moving around in a warehouse. There are no tags on the floor. There are no motion capture cameras. There's no GPS, obviously. This is indoors, right? And these robots have to work like human beings. So they have to figure out where to go and pick up a parcel. They'll have to wait for the parcel, politely take the parcel, and only once it has been loaded, start to move at a very high speed, up to five meters per second, get to the other end of the warehouse to a point that they didn't know what that point was when they picked up that parcel because you know they didn't know where that where they had to go. And somebody would be directing them to this whole process. It looks like an orchestrated dance humans and robots working together like what i call a kind of like a next generation swan lake effectively. interesting <laughs> interesting you can actually share your screen if you have the video you can share your screen and show it uh if that's challenging uh no need to do it uh live i can i can grab that later and and share that later but if you've got it available do you have it available to to, to pull up on your screen uh, i'm trying to see if i can do that right away right okay no here. worries give that a shot <clears throat> It's it's a super interesting concept because you can you can imagine how an Amazon would love to do something like this. Amazon, of course, bought uh, the Kiva robots um, that the company that built them, and yeah. they're probably one of the larger um, installations globally of of workplace robots. And frankly, from what I hear from people who work in Amazon distribution centers and the repetitive stress injuries that they have, uh, it yeah. would be a good thing. <laughs> No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Amazon. I'll just talk about that while this is uh, logging in, is that uh, a lot of people when we started off said the same thing, said, you know, look, guys, what about Kiva? What about Amazon? And I said, what's interesting about the Amazon approach doing that, and they tried that too with Kiva, is that you have to build a warehouse that's Kiva compliant. That's yes. Said. And the rest of the world doesn't want to do that. And Amazon, obviously, for its own competitive, it doesn't want to give you their technology. But we, as a software, we can just say any company, whether that's Walmart, uh, you know, or any of the other large American companies that some of them which you are working with, just takes our software and starts deploying that in their warehouses, and it looks cool. So here's a video that I can actually, uh, yeah, I think I'm here. Manage videos, my videos. Tick tick tick. Uh, let's see how fast this goes. Everybody's working from home, but 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can get this going in a second, and we probably can. So I want to show you two videos, one that is uh, up and going, and that'll tell you what, um, uh, you know, an, an example of what we're able to do. And another one, which is a kind of where we can go to. So that's kind cool. of like the next generation. Here we go. Fully autonomous parcel, sorry. Right. Excellent. So I'm going to share my screen. So you need to click the share screen uh, button at the bottom yep. of your screen and then pick the window with the video in it which is uh, not... And then I can make it full screen. I think it's probably this one. I love the uh, the idea of of making it work for factories that are not built for automation because we're going to be working with people for large large portions of time. You're going to have some robots that can do some parts of it, but you're not going to be able to invest in robots that do everything right away. You probably don't have the money to be able to do that. Uh, but um, being able to have a system that enables people to work with robots makes a ton of sense. If you can't pull up the video, that's fine. There is a share screen button at the bottom of your of your uh, web browser and then you can pick the window that the uh, video is in and then I can make it full screen here. Uh, we may have lost Kumardev. Um, I'm getting no uh, video from him uh, so I may have to end this session and pull it up a little later. Uh, there are a lot of uh, strains on global internet infrastructure right now. So uh, in any case, I will get uh, more information from Kumardev and unmanned.life 
uh, for my eventual article on this, but it looks like we are kind of toast for this particular session. So Kumradev, thank you for joining us. I apologize that we could not uh, do more. Oh, hang on. Um, well, we've got two Kumradevs now. <laughs> And um, yes, <laughs> that is that is you. You're back. <laughs> this is live TV, guys. Simulating. Um, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Now we've got something awesome. And if you can maximize that, that'd be great. And talk us through it. Yeah. What happened to you? There we go. This is video on video. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this should work. Come on, guys. It was just working a second ago. You're asking a lot of your internet connection. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're doing full live yeah, yeah. video. There we go. So you see how that's all working together? Yes. And those carts know where to go? Yeah. They're even queuing properly, more properly than humans queue. <laughs> uh, where's the six feet or two meters of distance? <laughs> exactly. Are they social distancing? Don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was done before the whole COVID situation. Yes, of course. I totally get it. Um, and we may have lost Kumardev again. Oh, the video is buffering. I see you're on Vimeo. I, I know a lot of people pick Vimeo, uh, but I swear to you, it requires way more buffering than YouTube. I, in every okay. situation I've ever tried it, YouTube is just smarter and better at getting video out faster. Interesting to say that. I'm going to try that next time. Yeah. So here you've got robots that are taking things from a place to another place and they can move it onto a table. I see that. Um, what other components uh, do, you, do you have or do you foresee being needed? Yeah, I'll show you. Uh, uh, I mean, this is just robots on the ground. We even do drones working together, and, uh, figuring out how to do stuff together online. And yes. what I can do here is I can stop this because, you know, this is... Um, I'll, I'll show you what we can do with uh, drones online. And the same thing is just as we can work with robots indoor, we can yes. work with drones outdoor. For example, in an emergency scenario where drones need to work together and figure out what's going on and then deploy uh, some camera feedback and allow our first response. Uh, how should they respond to this particular incident? Good. Um, seems like your internet connection is a little unstable, so uh, I'll let you pull that up, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on audio in just a moment. Where are you based right now, by the way? I'm in Brussels currently. I'm quarantining. Brussels? Yeah, I'm locked down in Brussels. Um, it's one of my homes. Uh, so we have London, San Francisco, uh, Brussels, and this is Brussels, really. Wrong video. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just pull that up for you in a second. What is the video that you're looking for? You mentioned drones. What are the drones doing? So the drones are working together uh, to respond to an emergency. So they're flying uh, and they're, they're giving data to a, uh, to a company to uh, first responders so that they can figure out what's going on. And oh, they can okay. Yeah, so, so you can sort of send the drones on ahead of you. Perhaps it's a firefighting situation or something like that. You can send the drones, exactly. get some imagery and some data on what's coming or what's happening and be able yeah. to respond to it quicker. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And I'm just going to, it's going to load up in a second. It's a very short video again, two minutes. So we can probably plug it into that. Um, the internet connection is so bad here. <laughs> <laughs> What I have found for live streaming is that you have to have a wired connection. Otherwise, you drop frames, oh, okay. audio, and um, and I, I, I definitely upgraded my uh, internet connection here so that I could handle that. Um, but uh, as you look for that, um, you know, what, what are the gaps that you see that you're still needing to build? So uh, when we started out, the, 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 there was basically two assumptions that had to be uh, taken on head on. So the first one we just talked about, 
can hardware do everything? Can you build a hardware everything machine? And the answer to that obviously was that no, you can't. Right? You, you just yep. cannot build a you just cannot build a hardware uh, everything machine. The other assumption or the other challenge was can you do a software that's able to talk to different types of robots? So this is not just about talking to uh, two types of drones from two different uh, two types of drones from two different organizations or two types of drones from two different uh, manufacturers. It's about can you control a drone and a robot together with a robotic arm and can you com compose a fully autonomous team where there are different pieces of machine working together? Interesting. And the answer, right? So that is something that we are working on and we've done a bunch of that. We've got robots and drones to work together. Is uh, there is there a uh, a standard for uh, robot to robot communication? Uh, does it all go to the cloud first and then come back down? Does it go device to device? How does that so, work? So there's both types of operations. So you've got companies that do uh, like ClearPath and some others that build robots and they have proprietary protocol uh, where different robots can work together, right? I'm going to show you this video for a second because this is a video that's only 15 seconds, but it gives you a very good idea of the different types of stuff that we can do. Um, so if you look at this one, it gives you an example of what we're talking about. How do you get different machines to work together in a team in different environments uh, where there's no no similarity between the different environments? So do you see that at the moment? Um, I see a, a few videos in a Vimeo window. I do not see one video. Nothing uh, is playing. Let me share again. Stop screen, share screen, share screen. Chrome tab, settings. Here we go. Do you see that, John? Yes, I do. What are we what are we seeing here? So that so that's an example of different types of drones in different environments. So on the bottom hand, you've got drones and robots working indoor here. Uh, that's on 5G. That was the launch that we did with Deutsche Telekom in Berlin. Uh, so we are there, 5G Telecom partners. And you can see the drones and the robots take off and manage and work together, just like you know, it's incredible to see that happening. Cool, cool. Okay. Right? And then you see on what you see on the right hand side is. Um, yes. We lost it. That's okay. Let's just talk through it. Yeah, so what you see on the right-hand side on the top is drones flying in the sky, and they're responding to an autonomous emergency. You see big drones carrying first aid, and they're going to drop that first aid when it's the right time, and the emergency responder is there. What you see on the bottom left is what we just saw, robots working together in a warehouse. And on the right-hand side, again, you've got robots working in a warehouse, but uh, with along with drones and doing inventory management. So that's Right? So that's, that's basically, uh, John, the vision is that if you can – if you can get this done and we've got it done and then scale that up, suddenly that autonomous economy where you have robots or uh, teams of robots times with humans, sometimes without humans becomes a reality. Right. And so from the very beginning, the first challenge was, to, was to, yeah. So from the very beginning, the first challenge, how do you solve the hardware issue? Different types of hardware from different manufacturers that don't talk to each other, no standards, whatever. How do you crack, how do you crack that? Number two was how do you do different machines working together, right? And I often have this analogy: if we were like Superman, we could go up and then come down and walk, but that's just fantasy. Can you make that? Can you do that in reality, right? And that's yeah. what we've done. And where yeah. we're going from here is actually trying to scale that up and do how a large number of robots working together in teams. And well, that's and the challenge is as well that the human body, I mean, is kind of like a Superman to a robot. I mean, the, the number of different things we can do, we can sit, we can stand, we can walk, we can run, we can handle with our fingers, you know, versus most robots are built to do kind of one or two or three of those things, maybe at the very most. And combining those in especially a mobile platform uh, with power is really, really challenging. Well, Kumradev, I think we're going to have to call it for now. We've had some internet challenges and other things like that, but saw yeah. some cool things. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, and we've had some people stick with us through the challenges. Thank you, Murray. Really do appreciate that. Thank you, Doug, as well, for uh, sharing some other things also. Anyways, wanted to thank you, uh, Kumradev, for taking the time. Really do appreciate it. I know it's a little later in your day as well. No, John, thank you very much. I hope that I was able to share some insights. And of course, with the better internet, we could have done a bit more. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, what's interesting is that we've managed to now enable something that was simply not possible before. 
And so the idea of autonomy as a service is no longer a concept. It's something that's been deployed by major governments around the world. I just want to leave you with one small nugget is that the city of Vienna is deploying the world's first fully autonomous uh, drone, ser uh, drone service for search and rescue. So our drones, like the ones you saw there, will take off from fire engines and will go and search for people who are lost or who've had, who are in distress. And then first responders will take that data and respond to that. And now with COVID, we are now deploying autonomous disinfection solutions. We just won the award today. We are one of the winners of the EU virus hackathon. I, I published that on my on my uh, Facebook. And uh, what we're saying is that you can have autonomous disinfection for hospitals and large public places and even indoors because our drones can do outdoors and indoors just like a human team would do, but there are no humans. So they're not at risk from COVID or at either to themselves or to others. And these drones can be deployed whenever you want. And yes. that's possible because of the software platform that we've tested and deployed at Walmart, uh, that we are tested and deployed with Walmart, with uh, Swiss Post, with uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom and other places and, um, and, and the city of Vienna, among other things. So definitely the future of autonomy is software and not hardware. But it's more than that. It's about software that is, that is hardware agnostic. Yes. And, and that layer of software can just run robots without the you having to think about what robots and how. Very, very interesting. And Murray, I think if you search for unmanned.life on Vimeo, you'll probably find it. Otherwise, I'll add it in the links later on. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you again, Kumradev. It's been super interesting. And for everybody else, uh, thank you for joining us on Tech First. My name is John Katsir. Appreciate you being along for the ride. Whatever platform you're on, like it, subscribe it, share, comment, all of the above. If you're on the podcast later on, please rate it and review it. That'd be a massive help. Until next time, this is John Katsir with Tech First. <laughs>